I think I have to start. That's a first. I don't think I've ever replaced a governor there to speak. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. I am Chris Vanek, the Curative Chief Operations Officer. Um, and in partnership with the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I'm really proud to say that uh, to date, we have administered 16,000 vaccines in the last two weeks in support of the great people of Massachusetts. I'd like to uh, especially uh, thank the governor for his partnership, the uh, Department of Public Health and Transportation, and especially our uh, great servicemen and service women in the Massachusetts uh, National Guard and Air Guard. Okay. You can be Governor. Absolutely. Today we're seeing an increased uh, efficiency uh, and patient satisfaction uh, over the last two weeks and decreasing waiting times, which I know was a concern uh, at the initial outset of uh, vaccinations. Uh, the public support that we've seen in the form of volunteer outreach has been especially uh, rewarding to date. and. Um, I'll turn it over now to your, your great governor from the Commonwealth, uh, Governor Baker, sir. Thank you. So thanks, Chris. And, and let me just thank the folks from the hotel for stepping up and making this site available uh, to us as part of this initiative. Um, I wanna thank the team at Curative for their work. They operate this site every day and, and for showing us around the site. Um, we're also joined by jo Joan Adam Roy, the CEO of Elder Services of the Merrimack Valley. Thanks for being with us today. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the continued expansion of our vaccine locations and some changes to support 75-year-old residents getting a COVID-19 vaccine at a mass vaccination site. I do wanna provide a quick update on our COVID-19 data. Health reported 1,319 new cases out of 52,112 tests. The seven-day average of reported cases is down 61% since it peaked on January 12th at 6,120 confirmed cases. Over 14.4 million total tests have now been administered in Massachusetts, and our hospital census is down 42% since peaking on January 4th at over 2,400. As of yesterday, 324 patients were in the ICU, and that number's down 30% since it peaked on January 12th at 461 patients. With respect to vaccines, as of Monday night, 910,412 doses have been administered to residents, and over 1.2 million have been shipped to the Commonwealth. We've been picking up the pace, and we're on track to have over 1 million doses administered very soon. On Monday alone, Massachusetts reported more than 50,000 doses for a total of 256,000 doses since the start of phase two, which was eight days ago. The administration has surpassed the first benchmark for phase two vaccinations, which was 242,000 per week capacity and administered 205,000 doses during the first seven days of phase two. Over 70% of total doses shipped to Massachusetts have been reported into the state's database as administered. And we're continuing to add appointments at vaccination sites statewide. And as media outlets have reported, residents are finding open appointments at mass vaccination sites much more easily than they were when they first opened up. In total, we have about 130 sites statewide, a number that will increase to 165 sites by the middle of the month. And over the course of this week, we're making over 100,000 new appointments available for next week at mass vaccination sites and pharmacies. Tomorrow at 8.30 a.m., 53,000 new appointments at mass vaccination sites will be posted online. That includes this site in Danvers, as well as the mass vaccination sites in Eastfield Mall in Springfield, Gillette Stadium, and Fenway Park. And over the course of this week, over 50,000 pharmacy appointments will be added on a regular daily basis. This includes 21,000 appointments at CVS going live tomorrow with an additional 3,000 appointments added each day through Sunday, almost 8,000 new appointments at Walgreens locations, 
3,100 new appointments at top co-locations like Wegmans, Big Y, and Price Chopper, and another 2,000 at retail locations like Stop and Shop and Hannaford's. All appointments can be scheduled online by visiting mass.gov COVID vaccine, or residents 75 and older can call 211 to get help booking an appointment if they're unable to do so using the website. We continue to add capacity through these mass vaccination sites, which are obviously high output locations where vaccines can be administered quickly and efficiently. Today, we're pleased to announce that there will be two more vac mass vaccination sites opening up later this month. One is in Natick at the Natick Mall and the other is in Dartmouth at Circuit City. The folks at Curative who run the site here in Danvers will also be the provider for the Dartmouth site and the Dartmouth site will open on February 24th. The provider at the Natick site will be LabCorp, a major national lab which has a big footprint in Metro West that also played an important role in the rollout of our testing strategy and the Natick site will be open on February 22nd. Both sites will be open to all eligible residents and we'll start with about 500 doses a day and we'll scale up over the next few weeks after that. The Dartmouth site will scale up to about 2,000 doses a day and the Natick site will scale up to about 3,000 doses a day. And appointments for both of these new sites will be available to book on mass.gov beginning on Thursday, February 18th, which is a week from this Thursday. As the vaccine process continues to grow, we're constantly looking for ways to improve it. And we started to see some progress as nearly 1 million residents have now received vaccines. And on February 1st, we started vaccines for residents that were 75 years old and older. These residents have been getting shots for the past 10 days. And during that time, we've learned that some people might be hesitant to go to a mass vaccination site without a relative or a caregiver. Some residents may be hesitant to go to a mass vaccination site alone or may have difficulty getting to a site. To support the 75 and older population here in Massachusetts get to a mass vaccination site, we're announcing a new policy to allow one caregiver to join a 75 or older resident here in Massachusetts and can also schedule their own appointment for a vaccine at the same site on the same day. Any caregiver is eligible to receive the vaccine at the same site as their 75-year-old partner. This includes a family member or a friend who is supporting someone who's 75 years or older. Appointments for 75 year and older residents and their caregivers should be scheduled for the same day and as close together as possible. But if you can't schedule two appointments at the same time or back to back, it's okay. The mass vaccination sites will make every effort to take both individuals at the same time. If both the caregiver and the 75 year old or older resident are unable to use or have difficulty accessing the internet, they can also call 211 for assistance to book both appointments. And this policy will go into effect on Thursday, February 11th, i.e. tomorrow. And it's not, it's not applicable for appointments that have already been booked. If a caregiver joins a 75 or older person for their second vaccination and has not yet received their first, the caregiver may receive a first dose while the 75 year old uh, or older person receives their second. We hope this change will encourage more 75 and older residents to get their vaccines at mass vaccination sites, which have, been, which have the most availability and are the best suited to provide safe access for our older res residents. With phase two of our vaccination program, distribution program well underway, we'll continue to make changes based on what we hear from others to improve access and streamline the process. Every week we've been making more progress to make it easier and more efficient for folks to schedule their appointments. And at this point, nearly a million doses have been administered here in Massachusetts. And over the past few days, there were thousands of open slots for people to book at our mass vaccination sites. We've launched the new call center and are making continuous improvements to the online scheduling process. We also launched a two and a half million dollar public awareness campaign to explain the importance of getting vaccinated and how the vaccine is safe and effective. And that campaign is in multiple languages. And we'll also continue to provide access for everyone to conveniently get a vaccine regardless of where you live 
um, within the constraints associated with supply. There's definitely light at the end of this tunnel. We're adding more appointments and capacity each week, and we're committed to moving as quickly as we possibly can along our distribution timeline. Ultimately, we have to rely on the supply that we receive from the federal government, but we will be ready to do more when more vaccine is available. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Secretary Sutters. Thank you. And thanks again to the folks at Curative and the folks here at the Double Tree for being terrific partners. It's an interesting use of the ballroom press conferences. Um, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, our friends at Curative and um, Joan Hatton Roy, the CEO of Elder Services of the Merrimack Valley. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I think it's still morning, so good morning. Uh, this is the second in operation vaccination location that I visited when we get to see um, individuals uh, going through the vaccination process. It is fast, easy, and safe. You know, and they aren't necessarily familiar. They're new, they're unknown for many people. So I get it. The idea of a mass vaccination site can seem a bit daunting. If you didn't know what to expect, you might be anxious about what it would be like when you arrived. These vaccination locations have staff in place to help people navigate from the moment you arrive to the moment that person departs and with your second appointment in hand. And our hope is that with the announcement today that someone who is taking an older adult, a trusted companion, a caregiver, a family member, with someone who's 75 or older, be vaccinated in tandem will bring an extra level of comfort to those who may be hesitant or don't want to bother their caregiver or loved one or a good friend to book an appointment. A few things to know about mass vaccination locations. The staff here are physicians, nurses, medical staff, volunteers, our National Guard. They allow someone to accompany a 75-year-old or older adult to the appointment if that individual needs assistance, as some of you, sir, have witnessed that. They have accessible drop-off and pickup areas. They're fully wheelchair accessible and do not require people to use stairs. And they have wheelchairs available, both in small, medium, and large sizes. Gillette Stadium, the Doubletree Hotel here in Danvers, the, East, the Eastfield Mall, Springfield, have accessible parking available. They also have accessible restroom and seating areas. They provide a medical grade mask for every person when they enter and support social distancing throughout the site. And they offer vaccinations for the staff who are administering the vaccines and give, ac give staff access to regular COVID-19 testing to ensure their safety. We understand that there are also some concerns about lines at mass vaccination locations. We strive to offer a no line experience trying to encourage people to not come early for their appointments, it is possible there might just be a wait. It's one of the times when, as I said, it's important to not come early. You don't have to get in line if your appointment isn't immediate. To streamline your visit to a mass vaccination site, we are asking folks to remain in your car until 15 minutes before your appointment. You won't lose your place. Please limit individuals who are joining you to one single trusted companion if needed. And to older adults out there and to everyone, please do not accept calls offering assistance from someone you do not know, you do not trust to take you to a vaccination appointment. We encourage you as the person eligible for the vaccine to reach out to your companion, your family member, a caregiver about accompanying you to the mass vaccination program. They can get vac vaccinated also. You know. I'm really comfortable where I get my health care, location, staff, physicians, but when it comes my turn, there's no question I will book at a mass vaccination location because it's easy, fast, and efficient. And you know what? It's all they do, so they really know how to do it with really good medical and support staff. And with that, it's now my privilege to turn the podium over to Joan Hadam Roy, who's the CEO of Elder Services of Merrimack Valley, I think now our largest elder services organization, but not just the largest, really extraordinary breadth and depth of services that you provide here. And you are truly one of the leaders in the age-friendly movement. And you had big, big shoes to step into when Rose decided that she was, she was old enough to retire and go on to her next journey. Yep, so please, welcome. Thank you. I understand I can't take off my mask right now. 
Um, I just want to thank um, Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor, um, excuse me, I don't have my glasses, L Lieutenant Governor Polito and Secretary Suttis for allowing me here um, to represent the aging network in this endeavor. I, I'm very fortunate that I have colleagues across the state. Uh, Massachusetts is really far beyond most states in our country that have resources for the seniors in, our, in the Commonwealth. And so I'm here representing the Aging Service Access Points, Councils on Aging, and all of the support that we can give to really support the Commonwealth's efforts to get um, our seniors vaccinated. When the pandemic um, hit, one of the things that we were able to do with the support of the state is to continue to pro provide those in-services, those in-home services, critical services such as Meals on Wheels, grocery shopping, um, transportation, decrease in social isolation, and trying to address the mental health needs of the seniors as this pandemic um, went on for, the, uh, for over a year now. I think we're hitting the anniversary pretty soon of, of when we all had to shut down. Um, so we've been able to hear the concerns. We've been able to provide that support. And we've been able really to help behind the scenes support the efforts of the Commonwealth to serve those. With this new um, initiative allowing the caregivers um, to accompany our seniors to their appointments is really a game changer. One of the things that we try to say is remove all barriers at any point, whatever we need to do to get that senior to, to a vaccination site. And this one of the barriers that we did see was as, as Secretary said, as mentioned, the fear, the anxiety. I get nervous going to a Patriots game at Gillette, so I can imagine a senior trying to, you know, think about going to the Gillette Stadium. But by allowing a caregiver um, or a trusted friend to accompany them, I think that is a, certainly a game changer. When the pandemic hit, it was those caregivers, it was the friends, it was the neighbors who came to the rescue when, when formal caregivers could not get into the homes or, or go out and visit. So. To reward them in this way, I think, is, is really a critical, a critical move, and I really thank um, the governor and his team for allowing that to happen. We do hear all the anxieties, I'm sure, as everybody is hearing, the anxieties, the nervousness. We're trying to be that trusted voice to say, you will get your vaccination if you want it, to step back, relax, allow us to all support the efforts. The Aging Service Network is here to assist with scheduling appointments. We're helping with transportation. We're helping with companion, which now makes it a little bit easier with this new um, announcement. And any other needs that you may have or seniors may have in order to get themselves vaccinated. So I encourage you to reach out. I encourage you to call your local agencies um, and really ask for the help that you need. You deserve it. And we really encourage you to schedule your appointment and and get vaccinated so thank you and thank you for the opportunity governor i think if you look at the data um being over the age of 75, being over the age of 85, those communities are far more likely to lose their life and get hospitalized as a result of COVID. And it's not like 5% or 10%, it's like multiples. And we wanna make sure that we make it as easy as we possibly can for folks who fall into that over 75 category to get vaccinated and to get vaccinated early in this process. Think about how much things changed for the over 75 crowd when supermarkets started making it possible for them to have a particular day or a particular morning to go to the supermarket. Many of those institutions have kept that over 75 day in place ever since. And the reason they did it it's because they realized for a lot of people it was a game changer with respect to their ability and their willingness to go. And as we were talking to the folks from Curative earlier, there are folks in this group who are showing up 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes before their appointment because concerns that, you know, the place is going to run out of vaccine or my appointment might not happen or it might get canceled. I mean, this is not 
um, a community, generally speaking, um, that is necessarily across the board going to leap into this without giving them a little bit of time and some support to get there. Now the good news is, literally, probably more than 100,000 at this point of people over the age of 75 will know a lot more about this tomorrow when we get sort of updated on the data load. But a ton of people over the age of 75 have already done this at mass vac sites. We want to make sure before we go to a next category that we've gotten everybody we can possibly get who falls into that classification who's not getting vaccinated through a skilled nursing facility program or an assisted living uh, facility program or a senior housing program or, or a 202 program. We want to make sure all the folks who can possibly make it um, do so that when we go to the next group, we can be pretty sure and pretty comfortable that we've done all we could straight out of the gate for those folks over the age of 75. I did, look, I do, we were talking about this, and this is one of the things that some of the folks in the senior community said to us, was, you know, if you really want to move up the, the numbers on this, if you want to get more of them to come, you know, give them the ability to bring somebody who's a trusted um, caregiver, yeah. could be a companion is probably a better word, um, and make it possible for that person. Because one of the things we heard from some of the senior groups was that people don't want to put the burden, if you want to call it that, on, um, on a family member, companion, friend, whatever it might be, um, to take them to a mass vac site to get vaccinated. Um, one way to make it a little less of a burden, or to feel like they're being a burden when they ask somebody to help them do it, is to be able to say that that person uh, can get vaccinated when they come with them. Many 72, 73, and 74-year-olds have been the companion who have shown up at these sites with the people who are 75-year-old, 75 or older, and have asked exactly the, that question. Um, and it's a good one. I think, the, um, I think the opportunity here is to actually get more of the 75-year-old community to go through this process. Many of them will still come the way they've been coming. And you know, anybody who's been with us on any of the visits we've done to any of these sites knows that the vast majority of the people who are showing up at these sites are in fact the 75 year old community plus 75 plus um, but i think if we can encourage more of them to come um, and to get their shots in the long run even in the short run that's a good thing both from a health and safety point of view and from a um, and a public so safety are, point of view I think just the opposite. I think what's more likely to happen is you'll get a lot more of the 75-year-old community to agree to come and get vaccinated because they'll be willing to ask somebody to help them come with them, um, and that will make it easier to move into the next round. Governor, I see Captain Smith from the National Guard announced today that he's got a team here in Danvers. There'll be a team in Springfield. They have told us repeatedly, we don't need them, we don't need them now. We'll, we'll let you know when, when you call the Guard. Yeah, I never, I never, for the record, I have never, ever, since I became governor, said we don't need the National Guard. I would, I would say over the course of my time in office, time and time again, we've relied on the National Guard to do all kinds of things. And the biggest thing they've been helping us with over the course of the past five or six months has been SNFs, long-term care facilities, where they have been a critical asset and ensuring that we do everything we possibly can to keep folks who are in what most people would agree is one of the most challenging environments um, in congregate care, which is long-term care for people with disabilities who are elderly and managed in skilled nursing facilities. I also said that when we got to the point where it would make sense to bring them in, we would. And they are currently doing what I would describe 
um, as important work around logistics and operations at a number of these locations. And, as, and because they come when they're called, to get back to um, Jonathan's point about that, they do. I don't need to give them a heck of a lot of lead time to ask them to get involved in stuff. Like I said, we, we use them when we think they can be extremely helpful to us. At one of the things that they have at Fenway that we don't have at other sites is we have the people who manage a lot of the logistics associated with the Boston Marathon who are helping with the logistics there. And the folks at Gillette, I mean, they're very, I mean, <laughs> they're among the very best crowd management and, and sort of logistical operators we have here in the Commonwealth because of the nature of what goes on there, not just the games, but also the concerts and all the other events. <laughs> we decided that we did. Why not? I know that, and for a week and a half we didn't do it, and now we are. I don't understand what the difference is. I mean, we said we would use them, and we we thought it was appropriate in some of these sites to bring them in for logistical support purposes. I don't understand why that's such a hard concept. It's it's kind of been the way we've been working. We've been working with them on an as needed basis, not just through this crisis, but through many others as well for. Long time. The date's going to come when we feel like we've gotten to the point where we've reached a big enough portion of the 75 year old population to move on. Pardon me? I'll know much better, I'll give you a much better answer on that one by Friday. I mean, some of this data rolls every week along with the vaccination distribution we get from the feds. What about the Why do we get company programs for NASA? Is it because they just have that average of They're really high performers. If you look at the performance across the country, the states that have done the best job in getting shots into people's arms are the states that have big sites. They are by far the most productive operating model anywhere in the country. And at this point, they represent a pretty significant portion of the shots that we're getting into arms here in Massachusetts, which is why we're adding two more, one in Metro West and another one uh, in the South Coast. I think for, uh, for us, with the limited amount of doses we have and the incredible pressure to get as many doses into people's arms as we possibly can as quickly as possible, um, following what has proven to be most successful in most other places in the country is to use very big sites to move big numbers and then to build collaboratives in places where you don't have big population centers which is why we have a collaborative in Berkshire County, a collaborative in Worcester County, a collaborative in Barnstable County, and a collaborative in Franklin County. That is, in many respects, the fastest and best way to move um, administration forward with a limited supply of vaccine. We had 451,000 asks for first doses, and we had 100,000, 103,000 first doses to distribute. Look, I would love to be able to distribute more doses, right? I can't do that until the federal government makes a decision with respect to J&J &J and until things change with respect to the volume that's associated with the Moderna and Pfizer distribution.
Um, Secretary and I have talked about this, and we're talking to the advisory group as well about this. And believe me, this is a very top of mind issue for all the reasons you just raised. It's not consistent with the CDC guidance, but it's something we're definitely talking about. Soon. Um, since I don't know the answer, I don't know the total answer to the phase two number for a couple of days, it's hard to answer the phase one number because remember, all those people who are eligible in phase one can continue to get vaccinated all the way through the process. Um, the nursing home number is completely, it's, it's calculated, remember that's a federal program and it's run by, um, it's run, it's managed by CVS and Walgreens, but it's basically run by the feds and it's separate from the stuff we're doing. Um, the, no, no, no. Um, so, so the, the best way I can describe it is to say that it's, um, it's kind of an organized, it's like a route, right? You know, you're, you're gonna hit this one, this one, this one, and this one today, and then tomorrow this one, this one, this one, and this one, and you do, you do the route. Then you go back and you do the route again, and then you go back and do the route again. They, this'll be, they're in the midst of the third trip. Now, there may be, probably will be, um, on the third trip through, residents who didn't get vaccinated in the first three trips who will show or the, didn't get vaccinated in the first two trips who on the third trip through will say you know what you know a bunch of my friends here did get vaccinated um they got both doses they seem to be doing okay so now i'm gonna i i think i want to get vaccinated and the same thing is happening uh with staff so my guess is there will be a fourth swing through i mean at this point in time i think 88 percent of the residents of the SNFs and about 65 percent of the staff um, 63% of the staff have gotten vaccinated, but you know, we can't, <laughs> this is the, this is one of the challenges with the two dose, right? You can't stop running the program. If people show up on the second or third visit to get a first vaccine because they decided after they saw their coworkers or fellow residents get vaccinated that now they want to get vaccinated. And and people are still coming in who are part of phase one. I mean, there are first responders who are still getting vaccinated in some of these mass vac sites. There are folks who are um, healthcare workers who are still getting vaccinated at some of these sites. Well, obviously, the, the storage requirements for both Pfizer and Moderna make the process not just of storing them, but also using them more complicated than it would be for a vaccine that didn't require a deep freeze followed by a thaw, followed by a certain period of time where you have to use it and you can't refreeze it, right? The J&J &J vaccine, one of the reasons so many of us are interested in it is because it doesn't have that kind of um, really high bar with respect to how you manage it um, to be able to use it. Um, the, you know, any vaccine that gets lost is um, a missed opportunity to vaccinate somebody, which, especially when you're talking about the populations we're talking about here, is a tremendous um, loss and um, and I think what I would say about that is most of the sites are working on guidance they got from us so are the providers um, all of the folks who do this about um, how to manage especially the latter part of your day with respect to your schedule and to have 
sort of callbacks or quick call people that you believe you can get vaccinated um, who are eligible if some people don't show up. And, um, and I think at this point in time, that's worked reasonably well. The other issue, frankly, just to get really narrow about it, is you know there's five or six shots in a in a vial, and um, so to be really accurate, you got to make sure you are going to be able to use all six shots in each vial. And one of the things that does happen, some of it is um, for a bunch of reasons. It's not that it gets wasted; it it, it isn't usable because of something that happened with respect to either the thawing process or the process of mixing it up. Um, but I think at this point, the, the loss rate is 0.13%. Now, that still represents roughly 1,300 um, vaccines, which we would have much rather see go in somebody's arms. And if anybody is, if anybody performs really poorly on this, we're just gonna stop giving them vaccine. The numbers are small enough that I wouldn't draw broad conclusions about one or the other. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they're pretty close, to, pretty much close to 100% of what they get, they administer quickly. So I don't know what the issue you're raising with respect. I mean, there's been an ongoing and extremely difficult, for a lot of reasons, debate and discussion between the wind industry and the fishing community for a long time. And, um, and one of the reasons I took a trip to London back before the pandemic was literally to meet with the fishing community in England, which had been dealing with offshore wind for years, to get a sense from them about process and procedure, um, because they seem to be both doing quite well. I mean, England has a ton of, the UK has a ton of offshore wind, and they also have a very vibrant fishing community. Um, and it was a very helpful trip in terms of how to think about these issues going forward. Um, but the uh, but there are definitely uh, challenges just by virtue of the issues associated with change that are tied up in, um, in any offshore wind activity, especially a new one, which is what we're talking about here. And we're gonna, we have been and will continue to be um, big supporters of, uh, of the fishing community here in the Commonwealth and beyond down the coast, because some of the folks in the Commonwealth actually do a lot of their fishing in other people's waters, um, and at the same time, come up with strategies that will make it possible for people to cite a clean and uh, an important element of uh, this country's energy future, which is offshore wind. <laughs> I already told you that I thought the comments that were on that video last week did not speak for the administration in terms of tone, substance, style, or anything else. And that continues to be my position. He does not speak for me. I happen to think in all of these issues, the goal here is to balance the various interests that are involved. The issue with respect to offshore wind and fishing, you have to figure out some way to create balance there. The issue associated with all of these issues requires figuring out some way of balancing interests. And, um, and when I say no one speaks for me, if they say 
you know, this one is going to be the loser and this one is going to be the winner. That is not the way. Look, in five years, six years, this administration, time and time again, has worked extremely hard to find common ground and balance when we make decisions among competing interests. And I get the fact that there are always going to be many competing interests um, when you get into any of these issues. But, um, but that's the way, you know, that's the way we should make policy. And that means in some respects um, we'll make decisions like we believe the fastest way and the most appropriate way um, to deal with some of the issues around climate is to pursue a strategy with respect to buses and automobiles that's more aggressive than the strategy that might be associated with doing something in some other mechanism. Um, but that's our sort of way of framing what we think of as the biggest benefit for the least cost. And, um, and I don't think you can go through these conversations. There, there is no such thing when you're having these kinds of discussions that doesn't involve competing interests. And it's the job of the folks in government to figure out how to manage that. First, I've heard of it. Um, so I'm not, I mean, are they over the age of 75 or not? I haven't seen it. We'll certainly look at it. Um, one of the other things I've learned from my conversations with governors in other states that are high performers is the more complicated you make the process, um, the harder it is to get shots on arms. And that's one of the reasons um, we decided to make a clear distinction around 75-year-olds followed by 65-year-olds with people and people with two comorbidities, pretty clearly defined. Um, I, uh, but I haven't seen the letter, so we'll we'll take a look at it and make sure we get back to them. Thank you. I'm not going to put a number on it, and the main reason I'm not going to put a number on it is I don't want to get it wrong, and. The biggest driver in this is going to be how quickly uh, the 75 plus community um, can get to the point where we vaccinated enough of them to be comfortable that if we open this up to a, another very big group that will be very anxious to get the shot, that if you're 75 or older, you'll still have the ability to maybe get vaccinated. I, I, you know, I'm going back to where I started. The data on the over 75 population, life or death, is so much different than the data for everybody else. Everybody else. I mean, the reason we started with, you know, long-term care facilities, that group in particular is off the charts relative to everybody else. The over 75 people are the next group that is literally most at risk here, by far. Now, the 65 and over people are more at risk than people under the age of 65. But honestly, we gotta get as far through the 75s as we can because they are, in many respects, um, far more vulnerable to COVID uh, than, than anybody else. I'd prefer they not be, obviously, because this is a program for people in Massachusetts. Um, but I don't see how we could deny them. So, you know, we spent a long time on the phone, the governors did, with the federal government talking about, like, kind of the question Sharman was asking, like, 
how far out, you know, we're all building capacity. We want, we're building capacity with an assumption that at some point we're going to want to be doing a million of these a month, right? When is that? Like, when do we need to have that level of capacity? And they gave me the same answer I gave you, which is we, you know, we'll get back to you. But what I would say in answer um, to your question is the amount of capacity we're going to have is going to be very much a function of the amount of vaccine we can project we're going to be receiving from the feds. And, you know, my hope is that we get to the point, and I've said this before, that we're doing a million vaccines a month because we have the volume coming and the capacity to do that. But um, for that to happen, the feds would have to start giving us 250,000 new doses, first doses a month, not 103. All right, thanks. Thanks.